you know, for that reason, I haven't covered cobalt on the show, I've covered lithium a very tiny bit, but the focus on the energy revolution has been all about copper. I got to ask you though, because, um, you, you know, a line I often hear Warren, when we talk about the battery, battery tech sector is copper is the new oil, but what's your reaction to that statement? Yeah, that is truly one of the dumbest statements I've ever heard. And I believe it, I'm not sure who it came out of, but I believe it was a large uh, U.S. investment bank who should remain nameless. That shows to me the level of dopiness in this whole sector. And hmm. we're at the early stage of the big copper rally, so people don't understand copper, they don't understand the role of it. Copper is the pipeline. Copper is not the oil. Hmm. The oil going forward will be uranium. Uranium needs to power the nuclear reactors, which is one of the only ways you could generate CO2 free base load power. The other one is hydro. We've already dammed up all our rivers. So going forward, yeah. trust me on this one, it'll be a uranium market. So that's why if people ask me what I'm playing, I'm playing two things. I'm playing the only source for base load CO2 free um, uh, power is nuclear power it's been generating the last 50 years you know in the u.s safe nuclear safe co2 non-co2 generating power going forward i'm aware of some of the technologies i have a friend of mine who works at terrestrial power they're made makers of these new fail-safe modular reactors you may have heard of yeah my my big thing i'm like every human on the planet i'm concerned about safety the the uh the reactors globally, there's about 450 of them in operation. They've been in operation for a long time. They've been operating safely. There's been Fukushima was a, tr a tragic accident. And then of course, uh, you know, Chernobyl, well, you know, yeah, you can't fix stupid, right? So, um, but there's a whole new generation of uh, fail safe reactors where the fuel is already in liquid form. So that uh, when power is stopped, Put it put in being put into the process to generate power to um, to create the fission reaction. When that power stops, as in the case of it was Fukushima, and when the power generators were were eliminated, the, the process just stops and there's no there's no spontaneous meltdown. Yeah, and I'm a huge fan of these new these new generation modular reactors because they don't take up a lot of space. Uh, the important thing with nuclear power is the standardization of component parts in nuclear reactors. And once we get a, a standard, let's say 300 megawatt modular reactor that all uses the same parts, well, you put four of them together to create a 1.2 gigawatt power facility and they're all using the same parts. So if one part breaks or one part needs servicing, well, guess what? There's uh, lots of them on the shelf. There'll be like, you know, a couple hundred of these modular reactors around the world. And so you get a level of economies of scale because right now, with current uh, current standard technology, every uh, new reactor to to a fair extent is like you know let's take a blank sheet of paper and we want a 1.35 gigawatt power reactor because we've done all our electricity counts and our growth projections and that's what we need. Well, yeah, I think in the new world and we don't know when the new world is going to happen. We'll just say okay, well. 1.2 gigawatts is close enough. Let's put in uh, four 300 megawatt uh, modular reactors. And then once you need, if you need a little bit more, we'll tack another one on in about 10 years time. Right. Consumption is there. So that's how I see the power grid building going forward. I think uh, wind power there, it's nonsense. These things are stone age technology and their lifespan is not great. You're looking at uh, nuclear power plants with, eight, you know, they're expanding their lifespan to 80 years. So we're talking, can you imagine a nuclear power plant running for 80 years? Like that's how you really bring down your, your cost per megawatt generated is having these massive long lives. But you know, you would get 20 years out of a, a you know, out of a wind, out of a wind farm. And then what do you do? You can't recycle this stuff. You have to put it in a big landfill. And so why you know, are huge? Why does does nuclear get such a bad rap? Because even you mentioned, like we all know Fukushima and you know, it was, it was a horrible disaster, but it was one disaster, right? How many oil spills, uh, pipes burst every year in the sector, yet we don't point the finger. We still reference Chernobyl, which is in the 80s, you know. Uh, yeah. Why does nuclear get such a bad rap? The infrequency of disasters is notable, yet it's the yeah, black sheep. 
But any competent scientists, uh, and we're talking competent scientists, like ones unrelated to uh, highly politicized groups like Greenpeace, where you know they're they're living in their own fantasy world. Mm. Uh, nuclear power is by far the safest base load. And you even all you have to do is look at the deaths from. You know, there's been three even remote nuclear accidents in the world. Uh, Fukushima, the, the, I think they'll say one or two people were, died as a result of that related to the reactor. The rest were due to the tsunami. And in Three Mile Island, nobody lost their lives. And that was a, there's a small release of radiation there. Uh, but Chernobyl, you know, what are we up to? You know, the, the numbers are questionable. How, what the number is, is it 50? Is it 100? Is it 200? Who knows? Yeah. That was a bad accident. That was, yeah. Bad design and competence, a whole bunch of things that are typically endemic of the, the Russians running uh, these reactors. So, but when you look at all those numbers, well, let's say it's 200 people or whatever the number you want to pick. Well, you know, you, you take a look at history of the number of collapsed power dams and where they just wipe out villages down, downstream and kill hundreds. And uh, look at even, uh, you know, some of the tailings dam accidents, uh, you know, with Valet down in Brazil and the hundreds of people killed there with these dams collapsing. So dam collapsing have, have, has killed way more people. Um, so in, in baseload, there's really three baseloads. There's, there's coal. I think everybody knows that coal, the number of pollutants that go into the air have killed a lot of people very, very early, especially in China. Um, the collapses of power dams throughout the world have killed hundreds and hundreds, of, if not thousands of people. And then nuclear is, you know, what's the number? It's not, not a super huge number. So um, what's happened there and why people are anti-nukes, I remember I grew up in the 70s, right? So, uh, and it was all Greenpeace putting out their Greenpeace flags, uh, anti-nuke, anti-nuke. So, you know, who was financing Greenpeace back then? Well, who had the most to lose? That was the coal industry, thermal coal. So they were sponsoring, they were kicking all the money they could to Greenpeace. And, um, and Greenpeace was hyping everybody up about how bad nuclear power was. So thanks to Greenpeace, instead of having nuclear power research for the last half century, we've, had, uh, we've been burning coal. Thank you, Greenpeace. What has is, what is burning coal done to the CO2 in the atmosphere? What, is, what has it done as far as killing people with the pollutants in the air? Uh, it's, it, it's one of the biggest environmental travesties, I think, because if we stuck on the path of nuclear power, can you imagine where we'd be today after 50 years of research into nuclear power and improving on what we had? Well, guess what? Nuclear power research has virtually shut down for the last 50 years. Fortunately, some hardcore people stuck to it. So that's why we're getting the next generation of Gen 4 nuclear reactors. So, um, that, that's, how, that's my take on it. And, you know, here we are today when it's, when you know everything's pretty darn obvious as to what's going on, you've got Greenpeace is still anti-nuke. Well, you know, I don't know what you want to power your uh, your vehicles as you go to your protests with. You want to, you know, fairy dust doesn't work very well in, in vehicles, and uh, you need some form of non-CO2 generating energy that's that's uh, fail-safe. And uh, nuclear power is is the future, I believe, and that could be fission now. In the future, if they develop, develop new, you know, thorium reactors with fusion or whatever else, but you know, to, to rely on Stone Age windmills in this day and age, it's pretty ridiculous. And you, you, you see the blight in the landscape. I'm, I'm originally from Ontario. My family farm, where you know, we cut it out of the woods in the 1800s. And when I go up there and I see the travesty of the uh, the wind farms and what they've done to the landscape, and then what's going to happen in 20 years when they all wear out and have to be buried somewhere. Like it's, it's truly terrible. And the, right. forgetting about the, the wildlife it's killing. And uh, then, you know, solar, while well, we live in Canada, you know how you go a month in Vancouver with no sun, right? So how are you going to exactly. power your, uh, your Apple laptop with that, right? So mm -hmm. I'm with you. Okay. Okay. Let's jump back to the copper sector. Uh, I love your analogy there. Copper is the pipeline. So what should investors be paying attention to, Warren? Is it time to play the early stage explorers? And if so, what should you be looking out for? 